Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 9 on. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons, listen to this, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Throughout this world's history, God has always had a people that he has set aside for holy purpose. It's interesting that when it comes to doing the work, God could have done it. He could have somehow let the rocks cry out. He could have used his angels to do the work. But God designed it that we would have an, a part in taking the good news to the world. So I want you to look with me at Revelation chapter 5 again, and particularly do I want you to look at verse 10. Revelation chapter 5 verse 10 says, You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. I want you to listen to that. What is it just said? Christ, who is you there, you have made them. Listen to the wording there. We talked about creation in the lesson study. Here we're talking about a recreation. You have made them. So Christ is busy with a work in us. And the work that he's busy doing in us is so that we will be a kingdom and a priest and priest to serve our God. Did you hear that? You were created for a purpose and the purpose for what you were created was to serve God, the Father. In actual fact, all creation throughout the universe has been created for the purpose of bringing glory to the Father. With this in mind, I want you to consider that we know that God called certain people, and I want you to see this with me. If you go with me to 1 Kings, I want you to notice there that we are introduced to a person by the name of Elijah. Now, Elijah was one of the most important prophets that actually, the reason why he was so important is that his purpose was very clear. He, he wasn't confused about what he had to do. His purpose was to get people to make up their minds. So in 1 Kings chapter 17, we have a, a verse that is made. Now bear in mind, listen to me, that Elijah was called with this one purpose in mind. And that was to help people to make up their minds. Which means that in some sense people were continually serving two masters. And Christ made it very clear that you cannot serve two masters. You have to choose one. And the purpose of Elijah was to get the people to choose the right one. Now, in order for people to be able to make a choice, you need to give them choices. Now, the, the Baal prophets had done their work. In actual fact, Jezebel had really been very strong in the, the, the proclamation of Baal worship. And as a result, 
the, 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 even the Jewish nation served Baal. And yet the Israelites never actually served Baal. They served the God of Isaac, Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But we are living in a world now where people are confused. Some of them don't even believe in God. So we find ourselves very much in the same situation that Elijah found himself. Now, dear friends, I want you to listen to this. In 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah makes a proclamation. And I'm always you know, I'm taken by this. He says to Ahab, who was the king of the Israelites there, in verse 1, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. I'm so glad I've got people <laughs> asking me. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead and said to Ahab, listen to what he says. As the Lord, now I want you to notice the word there for Lord is Yahweh, all capital letters. And the interesting thing is that that name was the name that God himself gave to Moses at the burning bush that when people ask who I am tell them I am who I am has sent me to you do you understand and then he says the word the Lord the God of Abraham the God of Isaac the God of Jacob that Lord sent me to you here we see very clearly that the same Lord that was involved with all of the forefathers before is the same Lord that is now communicating to Ahab through Elijah. Now I want you to listen to this. Elijah was the prophet. He was basically the mouthpiece of God. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve. Now dear friends, I want you to listen to a lot of this. Elijah made it very clear that he belonged to and was instrumental in God's hands. Now remember our opening verse. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God. Christ calls Elijah for the purpose of being of service to God. And the most amazing thing here he says, as the Lord Yahweh the God Elohim of the Israelites. We, Christ is speaking on behalf of the Godhead. He is the mouthpiece for God. If you read in Hebrews chapter 1, maybe you want to do this with me, go with me to Hebrews chapter 1, and I want you to see something. Hebrews chapter 1 says... Now, I like the fact that my Bible is taking a little longer to open up where it's supposed to. So it gives you time to catch up with me. Hebrews chapter 1. Listen to verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors. What does it say? Through the what? Prophets. At many times and in various ways. Here we have Elijah. And it says, God which is here referring to as the Father, spoke to mankind through prophets in many ways and in many occasions. Do you understand? Here we're looking at one specific one. You understand why I'm emphasizing this. But then it says in verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 1, But in these what? Last days... He, which is God again, has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed as heir of all things, and through whom also He made the universe. Then it says this, verse 3, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. 
Then it says this, after he had provided, listen to this, after he had provided purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Now, what I want you to understand is that in the past God spoke through prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us through his son. But now his son is occupying a seat in heaven, and so the, the son said to the disciples, you must go out and you must disciple people. You must go and make disciples for me. Now a disciple is simply another word for followers. We are to go out and make followers for Christ. In actual fact, in the New Testament, when you get to Acts, you find out that the people who were followers of the way, that's what they were called, were actually called Christians because they were followers of the way. They were disciples of Christ, who was the way, the truth, and the life. So, so the method that God is using, in the Old Testament, he used prophets in the New Testament, he used Christ, the Father used, but now that work has been transferred to his church. So I want you to listen. We as a church have been called into existence for a purpose, dear friends. But the problem is, looking at what the other churches are proclaiming, we've become confused as to what our message is. We are almost saying what they are saying. But we should not be saying what they say. We were called into existence. Now the interesting thing, if you think about it, after 1844, which was when the world... Now notice, what did we not have in 1844 that we do have now? This church. That's correct. 1844, there was no Seventh-day Adventist church. In actual fact, the Millerite group, Ellen White, etc., and the people who initially were the founders or the original followers or the people that made up the pioneers of this movement. Dear friends, I want you to listen to this. They were pioneers of a movement. We are not trying to follow Ellen White. We're not trying to follow the Millerites. We were called into existence, as it says in, in Revelation, from out of the nations. In Revelation chapter 5 it says, You have made them to be kingdoms. Who has been made? You have called persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. This church was called into existence out of many tribes, nations and languages. It's so interesting that while God was working on the Millerites, in, in America, he was working on a group of people here in South Africa. So God, out of all the nations, called a church into existence for a purpose. But somehow, because of our long time being in this world, we've forgotten our mission. We've lost our identity. How can we go and tell the world to prepare for something if we don't even know what we're telling them to prepare for? So what I'm trying to do today is to remind you that you've been called for a purpose. You've called, been called to be Elijah. In actual fact, I'm going to show you another Elijah that comes along. And we are counseled very clearly that this church is going to be Elijah. The Elijah message to the world. Now, if we want to know what the Elijah message was, then I think we need to go to Elijah. If we want to know what, how we should go about carrying out our work, we need to go and look at Elijah. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 17, we're back there, it says, 
As the Lord, the God of the Israelites, lives, whom I serve. Dear friends, I want you to understand, you have been called for a holy purpose. And when people ask you, why are you Seventh-day Adventists? You should say, because we've been called to service. Service who? Our Father in heaven. We've been called to be His instruments. The God of Israel. They will, and then he says, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. Dear friends, I want you to listen to this. This next piece of information is as eternal as what God is. God is immortal. The words that are going to come out of Jacob's, uh, uh, Elijah's mouth, in some sense, are founded on the eternal rock. Listen to what he says. Whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. What a powerful, powerful statement. Now, when we just read this, we kind of, first of all, wondering, what's, what's Elijah doing? Is he bringing misery to the world? I mean, what, what's the purpose of not letting it rain, dear friends? Is it punishing Ahab? Or is it preparing a people to make a decision? Did you hear me? The tragedies that are happening in your life, and dear friends, what's happening on planet Earth is actually trying to get people to be prepared to make finally the ultimate decision they will ever make. And it's not about how much money I've got in my bank account. It's not about, will I be able to handle this whole thing? It's not about, should I help my neighbor? It's got nothing to do with that. It's to be aware of what God is doing. He says, as the Lord spoke, I speak. And God allowed this words of Elijah to become effective. And dear friends, for two years, there was no water in the land. According to his word. I want to tell you, people who were not aware of their need of water, all of a sudden became aware of their need of water. You know, Jesus said to the people, I am the water of life. I'm that rock in the desert that you should actually come and drink from. But you know pe that people are not even, have a need to drink from the rock because there's so much water. And you know, we tend to love the things of God more than we love the, the God of the things. We tend to take the blessings he gives to us without recognizing the blesser. We walk around ignorant that God has a purpose in mind. And dear friends, all he did is he withdrew his hand. This world that says that there is no God, God says, okay, I want you to see what it's going to be like when I'm not around. Dear friends, we are left at the mercy of the devil. The reason why we haven't been wiped out is because God has restrained that. Because I read in Matthew 24 that if it was possible, even the elect of God would be destroyed. The very reason Elijah would have been destroyed if Jezebel could have got her hands on him. In actual fact, they sent people throughout the land, throughout the world, looking for Elijah to take him out. In actual fact, when they finally do meet Ahab and Elijah again, Ahab refers to him as the troublemaker of Israel. But in actual fact, Elijah makes it clear. He says, no, you've been the troublemaker of Israel. Now, I want you to understand something. They were suffering. We are introduced to a story here First of all, how that God provides Elijah with food miraculously. I mean, ravens bring him food. 
People are starving around. Was God not aware of their starvation? He actually saw the animals dying because every time they, they died, the breath would return back to the one who gave it to them. People were dying. Was God just trying to be malice here? Dear friends, when I look at what's happening around me in the world and I look at the economy, if only we would make up our minds if we serve mammon or if we serve God. But you know, we think mammon saves us. I want to see how we're going to eat money. When I look at the condition of the world, I recognize we know where else except in the same place that Elijah found himself with people who were so undecisive regarding whom they were going to serve. One day a week we come to church, the other six days we serve somebody else. We give more time to money than what we actually give to God. And I want to tell you something. You want to touch a person today? Touch his money. How many of you are finding that your money resources are running out? How many of you have actually found out that you have no money? I want to tell you there's a famine in the land. Why are we experiencing it? Dear friends, I'm counseled that Elijah didn't go hungry one day. He didn't go hungry one day. God actually sent ravens to him to feed him and had a brook providing him with water. Where are our miracles? How many of you can say to me today, God has been providing for you? I was so pleased to hear what um, Gerald said. How many of you recognize truthfully that God brought you through to where you are today? I want you to see something here. That we are exactly where Elijah was. The, the bad part is that we're not standing in Elijah's shoes, we're standing in the people who are suffering shoes. That's something wrong. There's something wrong here. You shouldn't be suffering. You should be sitting in the cave eating food from ravens. Your money should be sure. It should be pouring in. It should be carrying on. And even if those sources like the rivers run dry, what does God all of a sudden do? He sends Elijah not to a widow found in Israel, but a widow who was a Phoenician widow. But you know the most amazing thing about this Phoenician woman is she had already learnt the principle of courtesy, of hospitality. But I want you to understand something. That's not what I want to get caught up with. Miraculously, dear friends, not, not by human makings, Miraculously, Elijah, the woman, and her son survived almost three years of famine. People were dying around like flies. You know what, what I thought to myself about this? Here's this woman. She has a pot that is not running out of flour. And she has a jar that's not running out of oil until the rain falls again. Now, if she was interested in money, Man, this was a good opportunity to make some money. She could have told all the people, bring your pots here. And she could have poured each pot full. Because what will never happen to her pot? It will never run dry. She could have said, and she could have made a killing. Pardon? Yeah. Hang on. So the interesting thing is, I want you to pick up. Did God say that you are going to provide for everybody that's got a drought in the land? Would that not defeat the purpose of the drought? No, but God is going to provide you with what you need. But not so that you can go out and make it comfortable for them. No, they need to be very uncomfortable. Because I found that the time people make decisions is when they're uncomfortable. And dear friends, how many of you are uncomfortable? If you are uncomfortable, then it means you are not in Elijah's shoes, you are in the world's shoes. And God willing, I hope that you will find comfort in the words I'm sharing with you. You know, dear friends, I want you to notice that Elijah was not worried about food. How many of you are worried about your money? 
You should not be worried about money. You should be worried about what's happening to people. How many of the people that are dying are dying without ever making a decision for God? That should be your burden. Not if they've got money. That's the bank's problem. That's welfare's problem. In some sense, that's almost God's problem. But I want you to know that he brought God allowed famine on the land because famine was preparing people for Mount Carmel. You see, and Elijah never lost his vision. The most amazing thing in 1 Kings chapter 18, it says in verse 1, and listen to the words, dear friends, it's actually scary. Um, it's, mine starts off by saying, after a long time. Mm, that's really scary. I mean, how many of us want to suffer for a long time? How many of us want to continually have this problem we're having in the world for a long time? I mean, when is it enough time? When, when, when are we actually going to say, okay, we now surrender? When are we going to hand up the flag and white flag and start saying, well, okay, we, we've had enough now? In actual fact, Isaiah tells me we've got sores from our head right down to the soles of our feet and they are oozing all over and yet we are beaten all over and yet we refuse to come to the decision point. I look at this after a long time in the third year. It took them three years to get to the place. Three years! It makes me think of the Israelites. It took them 40 years to get into Canaan. How long is it going to take us as a world to get to the place where we will make up our minds? I mean, we're already with the third wave of coronavirus. I mean, I don't know. We, 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 we almost didn't handle the first one. I don't know how we got through the second one. I don't know how we're going to get through the third one. When I think of the economy and the... the, the man, we... This is a long time. Some of us have managed to survive up to now, but we're running dry. We need to start you know, trimming edges. You know? I mean, we, we're employing people which we can't afford anymore. We need to get rid of them. Sorry, but you know, we're, trying, and we, we're doing it. How long? I look at this. In the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And he says, go and present yourself to Ahab. And I will send rain on the land. But what does he do? God says, I'm going to send rain, but you must go to present yourself to Ahab. We have the whole story about him arriving there. What is the question that, Abraham, uh, that Elijah asks, dear friend? Listen to this. He asks in verse 21 of chapter 18. Elijah went before the people. Did you hear that? Before the people. And said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Stop sitting on the fence. You are not to be lukewarm. You are either to be hot or cold. It's time for you to make up your mind. And dear friends, I'm going to say this to you. Now this is a prediction. Okay, I want you to listen to carefully. We are going to have suffering in this world right up to the end. Because it's the only way that people start looking for either somebody to blame or to actually repent my question is are you standing or are you shaking because what can be shaken will be shaken dear friends and if there are things in your lives that shouldn't be there 
God's purpose is to remove it. You need to make a decision. Now, the Elijah message doesn't mean anything unless the message first speaks to us. Because you see, we are being prepared to be instruments. So we have to make our decision. And the moment you make your decision, you become the instrument in God's hands. We see that the message of Elijah was quite clear. That with what's going on in the world, we're not trying to talk peace, peace, because sudden destruction will come on you. We're not trying to say to people, hey, don't worry, everything's going to go away. Now, dear friends, we can't preach that message. That's not what's predicted in the word. But we can say, time for you to make a decision. Time for you to get serious. You know, the most beautiful thing is that the moment the people made a response, God did something. That's the beauty about it. When you make your decision, you're going to see the miracle of God in your life. You're going to see it, but you have to make that decision first. Then we have, jump with me quickly, to John chapter 1. And we have a, the most incredible thing happening there. Now you've got your, your hand in John chapter 1. Then I want you to jump over to Luke. Hand in um, John chapter 1, but I want you to jump over to Luke. And I'm going to introduce to you a story that you might have forgotten. Luke chapter 1. Both. You keep your finger in John chapter 1, but you go to Luke chapter 1. It says, and I'm reading from verse 5. Luke, thank you. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron, both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Do you have a group of people here? Do you hear that? Good parents, hey? But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. What happens in the story? Who am I talking about here now? They, Zechariah goes into the temple. The angel of the Lord, the one that approached Mary, actually approaches Zechariah and says to him, Hey, your wife's going to have a child. And you know, I'm amazed at this because he says to him, I want you to jump down to verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. And then it says this, And you are to give him the name John, dear friends, that's the only time that God ever interfered with the parents telling them what they must call their children. He interferes with Mary and Joseph. You will call the son child Jesus. He interferes with Zechariah and Elizabeth and says, you will call this boy child John. Not allowed to call him anything else. John. It says in verse 14, he will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never, and she gives the things, to take wine or ferment to drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Dear friends, listen to that. The birth of this church in 1844 was to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then says in verse 17, the most powerful verse ever, and he will go out before the Lord in the spirit and power of, what's it say there? Elijah. To their children and the, and the disobedience, disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make disciples, and then it says this, People prepared 
before the Lord? Do we prepare them for service in our church or do we prepare them for service in the Lord? Dear friends, so the point that I'm trying to bring out here, here's we have Elijah, John, brought into the existence for a purpose. Simply, simply, you know, and dear friends, the moment he said, behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world, his work stopped. I want you to go with me back to John. You will see in John chapter 1, John actually says in verse 22, finally they asked him, who are you? Dear friends, if you had to be asked this question as Seventh-day Adventists, what would you answer? Who are you? What would you answer? I think our answers would vary. We are so confused about our mission. Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. Who are you? Are you the troubler of Israel? What do you say about yourselves? Dear friends, I'm asking you this question. What do you say about yourselves? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet. Listen to this, dear friends. We should be almost answering the same way. This is verse 23. I am the voice of one calling in the what? That's a desert place. That's the world that we find ourselves in. That is, we are living in the desert, dear friends. I'm the one crying out in a desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. I want you to jump over to John chapter 3. I want you to listen to this. His disciples come and there's this confusion. Why is Jesus baptizing? We are baptizing. You know, at least getting more followers than we are. And there's this fight. You know, it's almost like in our church. Oh, it's not fair. They, they, they're winning more people to their church than to our church. And it's like, we, oh, you know, they, they can't be disciples of that church. They need to be disciples of our church. And we're having this bickering fight between Christians as to which church is the church. John doesn't get caught up with this because they actually come to John and they say to him, you know, listen, we've got a problem with that man that you baptized. We've got a problem with him. He's getting more people. Listen to John. Verse 27. A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. Dear friends, you can only present what you've been given from heaven. What did God call this church into existence to be? People who will be like Elijah, preparing a people for, for God. You yourselves can testify, I said, I'm not the Christ. We are not the saviors of the world. I'm not the Christ. But I'm sent ahead of him. Then he says this, the bride, that is the church, belongs to, to the groom. You do not belong to the church. In actual fact, you belong to the groom. You are his bride. And you are being prepared to meet the groom. Now listen to this. 29. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom. Now the word attends means gives assistance to or is at the service of the groom. It's like the best man. The best man waits to hear what the groom wants. He's attending the groom. Just as the bridemaid attends who? The bride. We as the church of God or instruments in his hands are attending to the groom's needs. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and hears from him what, he must, what we must do. And he is full of joy, the friend is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. Then it says this, that joy is mine and now is complete. What is John saying? I actually heard the, the groom's voice and my joy is complete. Then he says these words. Verse 30. Listen to this, dear friends. 
He must become greater. I must become less. He must become greater. I must die. How are we going to take this message that is more concerned about others when we are so focused on ourselves? How do you take a message where I is not the central figure, but others are? How do you take that message if you are only focused on I? And what I'm going to end off is with this. We are wasting time. We are wasting time. And people are suffering because we're wasting time. How long, Lord? How long still? That word, how long? How long still? Dear friends, how many of you have said, Lord, how long? I'm tired of this world. It's going to be as long as what it takes for us to go out and prepare a people for the Lord. And please, dear friends, bear in mind, the world is not getting better. I want to tell you something. I can prove this from God's word. We have moved into the last heartbeats of this world. This world that we're experiencing has never ever be, been before experienced on planet Earth. It's a, a unique time. It's because it's a time when our Heavenly Father is rounding off His work in righteousness. We are actually the last generation. Isn't that amazing? How long will we be divided? And then when we finally made up our minds that the Lord is our God, then let us just go and help others to make that same decision. Let's close our eyes. Our Father in heaven, We know that we have a purpose. Help us to be faithful to our calling. Help us not to make a strange people by our dress code or by the food we eat or by the language we speak. But help us to be strange because we love one another. Help us to be strange because we are calling fathers back to sons and sons back to fathers and mothers back to daughters and daughters back to mothers. Help us to be strange because we are uniting families and preparing them for Christ. Help us to be strange because we are preparing a people to be the bride for the bridegroom. Help us to be strange because you have called us and set us apart. Dear Jesus, thank you for calling us. May we be faithful to our calling, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.